late. Hi, hi. Fashionably late. Fashionably late. Story of my life, Bills. In the trash. That's how I deal with my bills. Throw them in the trash. Bank bullshit. In the trash. What? Bullshit taxes I have to pay. Should probably save these. Sober this time of year. You know what? I'm gonna celebrate today. Back home. So good. Okay, what's this? More crap. What's the number? A hundred? Almost at a hundred. We're gonna talk set up today. We're gonna talk about some of the most confusing stuff. We have Ryan Cavallari online. Ciao, Ryan. Good job at the recent races. Been going good. Uh, let me open this on the laptop, actually. Can we make this happen? Evening jail, bud. Yeah, I was, on, uh, uh, face I was in Facebook jail for three days. That's why I couldn't post. <laughs> Dave Wentz, what's happening? Okay, we're over 100. You must have spammed Captain Club Race. By the way, on the subject of Captain Club Race, how impressive was he at the Nationals? That was, that was good. That was some good racing by him. Let's see here. Opening up the comments on my laptop. Yeah, there's quite a delay on the on the phone it seems someone was saying that I'm just checking it out here let's see what the delay is I'm so confused right now yeah there's quite a delay Okay, so over 100 people, let's begin. We're just gonna keep this short and sweet, talk about some setup stuff. Okay, so we just, I could actually base this kind of on the Euros warm up, because the Euros warm up track was kind of special. It was like racing on concrete. It was, it was. This is how I would describe the track for the Euros warm-up in Portugal. It was like racing an EOS in Syria. And uh, what I mean by that is it's smooth and high grip like an EOS, like a carpet EOS. But America has called in a few drone strikes some precision strikes on certain places on the track. So it was super smooth and high bite with some really shitty jumps and some bomb holes. So that's the best way I would describe it. So EOS in Syria, that's what we were dealing with. Now, 
After the drone strikes, the problem also was that some dust would spread onto the high grip surface, which made it even harder. Because then you would be going from high grip to some dusty corner and be spinning out, if you went wide at least. And uh, then you'd hit a jump that had worn halfway through, so it was just a wall and your car would go all kinds of out of shape sideways and you barely clear the jump and it was just miserable. So, for that track, what do you do? That's why I'm talking about these front end things today because they're really relevant for a track like that. First thing, we've got a C-Hub here. For the black edition, we have two different ones that we use, 18 and 20 degrees. So for this track, as I said, super high bite, car was twitchy, it was hard to drive, go to the 20 degree caster. So add more caster on high grip, bumpy, difficult tracks. The reason you do that is because when you add more caster to the car, it will smooth out the steering a bit. So it, it won't be as aggressive off center. It won't be as aggressive into the corner. And also it will actually handle the bumpy stuff better. So definitely go 20 degree caster on these kind of tracks. So if you're on some sort of, you know, edgy track, your car feels hard to drive, you have enough steering, maybe even too much, try more caster. So that's the first change. Then another thing is kingpin inclination. So actually this track was perfect for testing this and really learning to understand what it does. And uh, here's a rundown on it. So I've, I've explained this to you before, but basically what kingpin inclination is, is you see the, the two screws here, the kingpin on top and the bottom. So if you draw a line through there, that's, that's the, the axis that the kingpins are on. Now, if you have no kingpin inclination, when you have zero camber, so that the wheel is vertical, the kingpins will also be vertical. If you have inclination, what that means is when the wheel is at zero camber, the kingpins will actually be inclined inwards. Now, what that does on a car is, uh, I don't have a car with wheels on right now. Let me just put wheels on this thing. It'll be easier to explain. So I tried both. Okay, I put wheels on the, on the other car. So when you have caster, especially if you have a lot of caster, so the C-Hub is angled back a lot. When you turn the wheels on the car, they will lean a lot. So how, how, did, how can you see this? So the inside wheel will flop over. You see how it's angled this way. The outside wheel, when you turn, will also flop over. It will turn this way. So the kingpin inclination, what happens is the outside wheel will want to flop over like this. With the kingpin inclination, it reduces that. So when you turn the wheel, it's more upright. So the outside wheel with kingpin inclination will be more upright. The inside wheel will flop over more. So that's what physically happens on the car when you change that. Now on the track, what happens is on a super high bite track, like this was, where the car was quite edgy and nervous. So around center, the car was very reactive. Adding the kingpin inclination dumbs that down. That's perfect for someone, you know, like a village idiot like me. So I understand that you know, dumbness. Well, it's a different kind of dumbness. What I mean is it's not as aggressive anymore. It just goes straight easier. You have to turn the wheel more to turn. The initial steering is smoother with the inclination. 
But then, when you well get into the corner, the car doesn't push. You can just turn the wheel more and the car will turn more. So initial steering is less, so it's easier to get into the corner. You can kind of turn the wheel more and the car doesn't re react as much. But then, in the corner, the, the car will turn more. So that's the good thing about the inclination on a track like this. It makes it easier to drive because the initial steering response is less, but you have enough steering in the corner because in the corner it will turn more. So why wouldn't you always run this then? Well, the problem is, let's say you have a track which has less grip or inconsistent grip. What could happen then is it's very easy going in again not so responsive but then in the corner you have more steering let's say when you get on the gas mid corner you'll have more steering and on a loose track that can mean, mean that the rear end of the car will break loose so you'll go in the corner then mid corner you'll spin out and the, it would make the car hard to drive then if you run the non inclined so that zero degree king thing in that on that loose track yes maybe you would have a slightly more response going in the corner but then once in the corner the car will be easier to handle because it won't oversteer anymore it will be more linear more logical it won't surprise you the steering will kind of always feel the same so you go in the corner and then mid corner the car will continue doing the same thing so it won't surprise you you won't spin out so this is actually a good uh, tuning aid i feel so just as a conclusion, with the kingpin inclination, we have two different options. The car comes as standard with a few degrees of inclination. I can't reveal the degree amount because Torrance de Guzman from HB Racing really wants to know how many degrees I have. He'll probably tell you if you ask him now that he doesn't care, but I know he cares. He really cares about that, but I'm not telling him. So uh, no one tell him how many degrees, okay? He has to measure it if he wants to find out. I kind of like that. So uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so we have two different uh, versions. Uh, the car comes standard with a few degrees that we're not going to disclose here of inclination. And the reason for that is it makes the car so easy around neutral. It's really easy to go into corners with it. Uh, then the old car came with the zero degree uh, steering knuckles. So no, so no inclination. And those are a good option that you should have and you should try both. Yes, it will be more responsive and more aggressive. But then once in the corner, you're not going to spin out. So I would try both. So for the Euros track, which is better? Definitely the inclined kingpins. The reason being, it's so much more smoother uh, around neutral, and then the track is so high bite that there's no risk of you spinning out. You go into a hairpin and you can turn the wheel more, it's easier to go in, and then you just turn around the hairpin and keep on going. There's like no risk of you really spinning out. So that's the kingpin inclination. I haven't really been reading your messages. I'm kind of tired. You know, we flew back from Portugal. Uh, the flight left at midnight and then arrived here at 20 past six. I didn't really sleep on the flight, maybe 45 minutes. And then I slept for two hours here, but kind of not really good sleep. So I kind of missed the night. So that's my excuse. That's why I'm not reading your comments. Uh, so, what then? Ackerman. Okay, let's talk about Ackerman a bit. The steering is really like the last thing, the, tr the real last thing about car design that is kind of a mystery to me. Like, I don't fully understand it. I don't know why, why things uh, happen the way they do. I think with the roll centers and... Uh, shock positions and c hubs and kingpins and all this stuff like i kind of understand what's happening i know why it works a certain way but the steering is a bit of a mystery honestly like i, I don't know really what the 
what we're looking for, like what the optimum is. So that's really the next thing I want to develop. But here, here are a few things we can talk about anyway, like the basics. So on the black edition, we have this, uh, this plate here. You see this, this carbon plate here. So the standard one is really the one we use the most, I would say. And it gives, it gives the car very smooth steering. So again, around center, the car is very smooth, not so responsive. And then once in the corner, you have more steering. And the reason for this is basically this. The steering link here is further towards the inside than on the other plates. So, so the longer, longer carbon plate here will make for smoother steering. Less initial, more in the corner. Then we have another plate, which is number three, which we also use as an option part. And that one we use when the car is too lazy. It doesn't quite, you can't really throw it in the, into the corner enough. You want a bit more response. Then you would put the number three on. And the number three is a bit shorter. So that outer link is further out. So the plate is shorter and the link is longer. And what that, that does is it gives you a bit more response. So those are the two plates we really use. Then on the inside here, we have uh, this side here, we have the Ackerman plate and we have three holes. And I tend to always run the front hole. For me, it just gives the best steering feel and the most steering. I feel like when I move the link back, it uh, it's kind of like smoother steering and also less overall steering it's it's it feels smoother because it's less overall steering so front hole good steering feel and the most steering for me rear hole the least amount of steering now for the euro truck again you might want to run the rear hole just because that the track has so much traction car has so much steering maybe you would want to try that to see if it can be it, if it's easier to drive with the link in the rear so Euros track, high, high grip, edgy track, 20 degree caster, so more caster, kingpin inclination because you want smoother initial steering, but then you want the car to turn in the corner. There's no risk of the rear uh, sliding because the grip is so high. You know, assuming you stay on line, but we're good drivers here. Then you would run the number one carbon plate, the longest one, smooth steering. And on the Ackerman, maybe experiment with going all the way back. So there we have it, folks. That's what you want to do. And the reason I say I don't really know, I don't really quite understand the steering fully is because when you draw, well, when you draw the roll sensors, for example, it's, it's quite simple because you simplify it into a two-dimensional plane. So you draw the arms and links and all that, pivot points and and you find the roll center and you figure out how the roll center is moving and it's all kind of straightforward the steering is difficult because we have caster kingpin inclination the steering is on a different plane it's like three dimensionally how the the pivots are moving is quite complicated so when you um when you simplify that to a 2d drawing some things get lost in translation also another thing is that the angular differences between different settings that make a noticeable different difference on the track are minimal they're minute they're so small we're talking about fractions of a degree so you plot everything out you figure out how the wheels are turning you look at the difference it's like nothing like holy shit that's all and then on the track you can actually tell a big difference so it's so it's hard to figure out what's happening 
So that's kind of why uh, I'm confused. So, I mean, okay, here's an, one example. So the outer carbon plate here, the longer plate, car has more Ackerman, right? Uh, more Ackerman, smoother initially, more steering in the corner. The rear hole here has uh, more Ackerman. I believe. Uh, but the opposite effect. You know, see what I'm saying? So it really has to do with uh, how the Ackerman comes in, at what point, how much, and that takes time to figure out. And that's my next kind of project here, to figure out the steering. So on this car, it's kind of limited what we can do, but when we eventually have a new car, then I expect to see quite a different steering system on there. Okay, I'm gonna check a few questions and then I'm gonna talk about arm heights because someone mentioned that early on. Let's see if someone said anything, anything sensible here. Fernando Almeida is just speaking Portuguese. Fernando, speak English or die? Um, can you change your inclination with a Dremel? That's not recommended. Definitely not recommended. That would be a lot of work. Uh, how did Team JQ do at Raw Nationals? Well, probably, probably done before noon. Here's someone saying something about Savoia in Portuguese. Wonder what that is. JQ likes the rear hole. I do. I like both rear holes. I like the kind of humans that have two holes. Two holes down there, you know? Uh, I talk to Will Smith a lot. He ain't about that JQ life. Will Smith. The famous Will Smith. What is a good range to be in for camber change and bump steer generally? You know, I... I haven't really measured the camber change, like how many degrees the camber change is to find the best. Bump steer. Try to minimize it. So the bump steer, you're actually gonna to have to adjust bump steer if you adjust the upper link. For example, if you change this plate here, you're gonna to have to adjust it. The way to do it is pretty simple. So the, the, the link ball here, it's offset so you can put it Two different directions and it will be a different height based on that also we have shims so you can run shims here on the inside between the ball and the Ackerman plate or outside here between the carbon plate and the, the ball so the idea is let's say at full droop the wheels tow out a lot and you want to get rid of that. Then what you would do is you would put shims here on the outside. Or you could put shims here on the inside actually too. Uh, and that would reduce that, the towing out of the car. Or vice versa, let's say on compression, let's say that the wheel is towing in a lot. What would you do then? Well, then you would re remove shims from here, from the outside, or add shims here. I actually said it wrong just now, so, sorry. Uh, so, you know, I'm fucking too tired to explain that to you. It's pretty simple, straightforward if you look at it. I mean, take your car, look at your car, 
figure out what the link is doing. You can see, oh, now, now the link is kind of pulling on the steering and towing it, towing it out. Hmm, I need to get that lower. Okay, so I need to kind of raise that. You know, figure it out. You can do it. I believe in you. I believe, you know, maybe Captain Club Race has made, this is kind of, maybe this is too advanced for Captain Club Race. He, only, he probably only spoke about the shims. Flashpoint probably makes shims, you know, that you can buy. So he's probably talked about the shims, but I don't know if he actually explained how to use them. Hi. Oh yeah, questions. How far should I thread the HB shock ends? Oh yeah. So, if you want to run the outside hole here on the arm, so we run middle or outside. If you run the outside, then you're gonna need longer shock ends. Now we've been running that HB Racing shock ends. I raided uh, David Ronifark's spare parts box and stole a bunch of shock ends. That's why we're running HB. And uh, you just thread them on all the way. Uh, they work fine. Uh, the problem is that they're made for four mil shock shafts. So I put some glue in the shock end and then, then uh, attach it and then it's good to go. And then the shock length should be 106. That's about it. And what else? I'm here, Sally. Teach me, says Anthony Westergaard. Anthony, what do you want to know? Let's, you know what? Let's help a brother out. Let's have Anthony. He lives in the middle of the desert, you know. He runs an HB. You know, Anthony needs some help. So let's have Anthony ask a question and then we can together help him. This is like an open kind of therapy session here. You know, Anthony, if you have some problems, just, you know, write them here. We're going to take care of you. Four shoe clutch. No. Oh. You know what? I should have a dedicated, uh, I'm going to have a dedicated Facebook Live for the Euros. Okay? I'm going to talk about the four shoe clutch there. Yeah, let's do that. I think next week I'm going to have a dedicated Facebook Live for the EOS in Syria. So the Euros are the first week of August and uh, we're going to talk about all the things you need to do for that race. Where did Anthony go now? We're supposed to help him. Well, while we're waiting for Anthony, let's talk about arm height. Let's talk about arm height. So, here, A and B blocks. We have plastic inserts. With those inserts, we can change the angle of the arm. So we can, uh, we can add more kick up, reduce kick up, or we can just raise and, and lower the arm. Now we're only going to talk about raising and lowering the arm. There we go. Now Anthony shows up. Just in the middle of something here. And this dick has to show up. What tires would you have run at our Nats? What a great question. Anthony, I don't know if you noticed, but I wasn't there. Then how would I know what tires I would have run? I wasn't there, for God's sake. Anthony, I was in Portugal. Well, I wouldn't have run Proline because they wouldn't fucking Proline tires didn't show up. Probably wouldn't have run AKA because I ordered my AKA tires in March, still haven't showed up. So I probably would have run J Concepts. Now, looking at the track, I would have probably run Detox. I would have probably run Detox in O2 or Y2. There you go, Anthony. What a dumb question. Now, come up with a good question. I'll, I'll talk about all my. Okay, so on the front, on the front, standard setup is zero and zero, so middle, middle height for the arm. Now, if you lower the arm, you just keep the same angle, just lower it, you'll have a bit more steering. The car will feel 
the front end will feel a bit softer. Roll more, more steering, more grip. That's good. Another benefit, something to keep in mind now for the Euros track. The car won't flip over as easy. So lowering the front arm, the car will have a less of a tendency to want to flip over. It's good on high grip. So, lower arm. If you do the opposite, you raise the arm, less steering, the front end is more stiff and they will want to flip over more. Where's Max? Max is at home. But you figured it out, pussy, says Anthony. Yeah, now Anthony, come up with a good question. Meanwhile, I will uh, talk about the rear arm height. So, rear arm, same thing. Standard setup, I believe, zero, zero. Middle, one degree anti-squat. If you just lower that rear arm, what happens is the rear will be softer. It will roll more. It will feel like it squats more when you accelerate. The rear end will just feel softer. <clears throat> but the benefit, the good, good thing about this is it's also less likely to flip over because it doesn't, the, instead of the rear going up, it will want to roll down. So it will drive more in the track when you do that. And that's a good thing. Because when you get on power and then you brake in a corner and then get back on power, the car will stay lower. The, car, the rear of the car will roll downwards instead of going up. So this is actually a good, uh, this is something important to get the balance right. So your car is kind of, the rear end wants to stay level, level or down, not kind of going up so much. So raising the arm, less traction, stiffer, but it will go, want, want to raise the rear. When you get it just right, the rear end will want to stay pretty flat everywhere and not go up, not down, like pretty flat. When you lower it maybe too much, what will happen is the rear will roll a, a lot, feel soft, and it will roll down, which is still good, but it kind of scrubs speed. So you really need to find the, the correct height for the rear arm to be fast. And again, something good for the Euros track to keep in mind, like run the arm as low as you can. So the car doesn't want to flip over, the rear doesn't want to, you know, come up mid corner, will stay low, but you're also not scrubbing speed in the corner. So yeah, high grip, low arms. With 20 degree caster, can you push the car more? Is it more forgiving? Yes, it's more forgiving. Less pointy to drive. Okay, Anthony finally came up with a question. Let's focus on Anthony's question now. 10 scale guys run same defoil front and rear. Would this work in eight scale? Oh my God. The answer is yes, it works in eight scale. Um, a lot of drivers actually secretly run this. They don't put it on their setup sheets. They're not going to tell you at the race. The reason is it's like a bit of a speed secret, you know? These top pros are kind of sneaky bastards. They don't want to let everything out of the bag. So if they're at a race and they end up running like 20,000 front, 5,000 center, 20,000 rear, they're not gonna tell you about it because they feel like that's a bit of an edge. Or 15, like Fernando here, Portuguese village idiot. See, even he knows. He's like the top Portugal has to offer on the village idiot scene. 15, 7, 15, see? He knows. So you go thick front diff, thick rear diff, and then a thinner center diff. And what that does is basically the car will be more four wheel drive. So on a high grip track like this one was, you could kind of, uh, you can attack more because going into the corner, the car won't be so nervous because of the thick rear diff. The rear diff, the thick rear diff is stopping the car from having steering into the corner. So it wants to push a bit. Then 
the thin center diff makes it so it's still controllable on throttle because the thick front and rear diff give a lot of drive. So when you get on power, you have a lot of drive out of the corner. But the center diff still distributes front to rear so the rear won't step out too much. So it's still kind of easy to drive. You go over the bump or you wheelie a bit or whatever happens, like the car won't be hard to control. It won't, the rear won't want to step out because of the thinner center diff. But because of the thick front and rear diff, it has a lot of drive. So easy to drive into the corner and then a lot of drive. So yes, it does work, but for example, for me, often the problem is I, I feel like I don't have enough steering in tight corners, like hairpins and switchbacks, and where you want the car to react quickly, it, it doesn't happen because of the thick rear diff. So it's kind of a, a, a driver preference thing also. So if you're comfortable with uh, driving a lot on, get on throttle and kind of making your corners a bit rounder then then it works good but if you're more like brake pivot accelerate then it's not going to be that good for you so for me for example that track i think some drivers use pretty heavy rear defaults but i don't really like it so i ran i ran uh 15 front 15 center and six rear and that was that was what i ended up with does the center diff fluid have an effect on engine temps? I never, I've never found, found something like that. I, I don't think so. Oh, Fernanda speaks English now. He's asking why I don't like 15715. I just explained it. It feels, it makes the rear end feel so stiff somehow it's like stiff and locked in it's like slow in corners if i really want if i want to break turn and go it doesn't do it you have to kind of roll around corners and make it rounder and be on power a lot and ah it's just not doesn't work for me that good okay there's still over 100 people here jesus christ are we gonna have to talk about something else time time with this shit So we done caster, we done kingpin inclination. We did a bit of Ackerman, but I don't really know what the hell's going on there. So couldn't be too specific. Did some arm height stuff, did some diff stuff. There used to be a Euro driver that ran like 100,000 in the rear diff. Okay, Keenan lay down the crack pipe, please. Come on. Talk about nationals, your opinion. You know what? To be honest, I didn't follow the nationals. I really didn't. Ty Tessman won, Rivkin was second. Someone was third. Cavalieri was third, Tilo fourth maybe. I honestly have not seen a whole lap of the nationals track. So maybe this week, I'll, uh, this weekend or next week, I'll check it out a bit. Holy shit, Joseph, you look like shit. Yes. Unfortunately, this is my face. I'm blessed with a shit looking face. When you talk to Robert, he's at 757. He was, yeah, I think he was going to try that. He wanted more drive. See, I think he said in the interview too, he was going to that because he was a bit slow and he needed to catch on Garo and he needed more drive and he figured, okay, that could work. The track was not smooth. Are you talking about the Nationals? It was, that was not Syria. That was pretty smooth. A couple of footprints, that's it. You go to the Portuguese Olympics, no luck with Olympics in Portugal. No, Olympics are not in Portugal. JQ diffs have more or less volume than others. Some guys were, it was about the same. 
like less than some brands. Like the Kyosha Center Diff obviously is much bigger, but the front and rear is about the same actually. I think HB diffs are bigger. I think new uh, MBX8 diffs are bigger too, I think. Uh, yeah. What tires did you run at the Bitty race and how was the track? The Bitty race track was awesome. What happened there? Try to remember, it's a long time ago now. Oh, Jesus Christ. Was I even in the main? Yeah, I was in the main. I can't, I can't for the life of me remember what happened in that race. I'm trying, I'm trying really hard to remember. I think I ran tires with two hard tires in the main. Because I tested afterwards, I should have run something else. Did I run Cosmos? I thought I ran detox. I should have run detox. Maybe that's what it was. Apparently I finished sixth. Oh, now I remember. Yeah, fuck. Yeah. Now I remember. So there was this freaking ridiculous section on the track that I crashed on. Three times, I think. Same place, like an idiot. And that basically cost me fourth place. I should have been fourth at that race. I had Joao figured my gyro covered, and then this other dude who's, I don't know his name, fucking Pinocchio glasses. I don't know. That guy I had covered too. But then I crashed, and I finished sixth. I must have run uh, Cosmos, yeah, because after the race, I remember, I tried Blue Compound Detox from J Concepts, and they were really good, and I should have run them. I was actually faster with them. So, I should have run Blue Detox, but I didn't. Yeah. Uh, if you want Red's Motors, just message us. We can get Red's anytime. Anytime. Yeah, I'm kind of out of gas. Can't think what to say next. I'm so tired. I'm actually staying here now for a while, for a month or so, so I'm pretty excited about that. I'm gonna get these Facebook lives up and going. I think we're gonna do, maybe even we can do here for the next month or so, we can do two a week. One is gonna be pure bullshit. I'm gonna talk some shit on people. I'm gonna talk about the International Federation of uh, Men Arranging Retreats. I'm gonna talk about 10 Day Worlds. I'm gonna talk about the fact that David Ronefuck shows up at the Euros warm up battling some of the best drivers in the world a day late. He has one practice round straight into qualifying. Finishes second in the race. Really kind of throws some questions up in the air here that do we really need a 10 day world championship? And is it really gonna change anything except some bank accounts? You know, we're gonna talk about all that stuff. And then the other one would be about setup. We're gonna talk, you know, shock setup and Euros track setup and I don't know, whatever you want. Think of something, we can talk about it. So yeah, I think two a week would be good. One for bullshit and another one for setup. I'm gonna talk about Captain Club Race for sure. Talk about all kinds of things. Fall Brawl, I'd kinda of like to go to Fall Brawl. Is Fall Brawl still happening? Is Lance retired? What's happening? You know, I like that race. Who is the favorite for the world? Ongaro fucking for sure. Actually, I forgot to paint, post a video I took of him driving. I think at this point in time, at this point in time, I have to say Ryan Ongaro is the favorite for the world. I'm sorry, David, I'm sorry, but 
Jesus Christ, I can't believe we're going with a stick radio and balls. It really hurts my soul to say this, but he's just so dialed right now. So Ryan Ongaro is the favorite. But I mean, if David wins or Robert wins or Mayfield or Tessman win, like, it's, it's, no one's going to be surprised. I mean, they're good too. But hey, there you have it. There's my favorite. Are we done? Did Anthony have some questions still? Anthony, did you um, did you accept my answer? I ran clay positrons. An hour later in the quarter, I ran X2 buckshots, and they were toast after 10 minutes. Good for you, Anthony. That's some real valuable information. We all appreciate your input. No unglued tires? No, Sandro, you weren't there, so all the tires stayed glued. Pedro Gomez. Hola, Pedro. Pedro Gonzalez. Ah, what's your goal for the World Championship? Okay, let's talk about that. Before we e-buggy this, let's talk about this. So my results have really been fucking terrible. I've really sucked. Like the DC, I was still trying, and then like, we all, we all know, DMC, we all know what happened there. I couldn't raise the main, I was fuck. And then since then, I've been, I've really sucked at races, but I said this, you can go back and you can look. You can look this up, people. I said on the Facebook Live, this year I really don't give a shit except for the Euros and the Worlds. The Euros and the Worlds. If I suck at the Euros and the Worlds, then you can say, JQ, you suck. You're a terrible driver. Can't design a car. Your car's terrible. You're an idiot. You can say that. But these races you can't because these races I'm intentionally trying different shit every time even this race the warm-up my car was pretty good at one point i'm like now nah, i'm gonna just change this up you know because i want to learn shit i want to be really good and prepared for the euros and for the world so i can just go there and do my best so i'm running different tires start running different pistons defaults this and that some things work some things don't but i'm trying all of that stuff so we have to wait we have to wait another two months because at the euros if I'm terrible, then you, you know I failed. But my hopes are high. I think I, I can do well. So Euros, I mean, I should be able to make the main. Let's face it. I really don't have any other goal than just make the main easily and have a, you know, have a clean race in the main. If I can finish the race, no big trouble, no issues, no mi big mistakes, then why not finish top five? Why not at the Euros? You know, half the field blows out, the other half, half flame out, someone loses a tire, boom, I'm top five. Now, Worlds is a different story. Worlds, I didn't go to the warm-up, I'm not going there before the event. Worlds is a bit hit and miss. I, I think that if the track and the surface and everything suits me, like I just put my car down and it's awesome and I'm feeling good, then I want to be in the semis and I want to be in the battle to make the main. Again, you know, half the field blows out, someone flames out, someone loses a tire, someone's radio goes dead, you know, I could make the main, you know. So that's really the goal. Just make the fucking mains and do my best. That's it. So Max will demolish you. Time to retire and get that pro driver. Well, that's the goal. Like I, th I feel like it's kind of funny that people are sort of making fun of me. Like, oh, Max is beating you. 
wouldn't be wouldn't it be worse if he didn't like i spent all this time and effort and money to fucking support this kid and then he just sucked forever like would that be better somehow like isn't the point that he beats me he should have beat me two years ago you know so I, I, don't, I don't get that. Like, it's good that he's finally starting to beat me. Now, he needs to be a lot better than that. Like, he needs to start beating Ungaro and those assholes, you know? That's where he should be heading. So, I don't know. I never really got that angle. Yeah. So, anyway, that's it. So... All these races, I've been trying a shit ton of stuff. Euros, I need to have everything in order. That race, I need to do well at. And if I don't, then yeah, make fun of me. Jim Neighbor is here. Liam likes guys. That's cool. I guess your mom's safe then. Any new trick methods to shut radios off? No, I, I did see that Sunway employed some sort of new kind of cover for the switch. It's kind of harder to reach. I'm, I'm going to have to do some training here before the Worlds, just to be ready if someone has the new Airtronics or new Sunway. Should always give 110% every race. You can only give 100%, okay? Let's just start there. Also... You can, uh, the race is the best place to learn new stuff. So you can just play it safe or you can go big. Maybe it will work, maybe it won't. So there's two different ways to look at it. Jim Neighbory is saying Cody is lame. Wow. Jesus can give 110%. Even Jesus can't give 110%. Even Jesus is limited to 100%. It really is so. Even Jesus has to conform to the laws of percentages. JQ proof on off radio switch has already been in invented by uh, Sir Neil Craig. Yes, I've seen it on Instagram. Or, I don't know. I think it was Instagram. What do you think about Carsten Keller? Well, to be quite frank, I don't think about Carsten Keller. So, there's your answer. Okay. I feel like we need to end this. We've still got 122 people on here. I don't know why. It's amazing. I want to thank all of you. Oh, by the way, I mentioned that video once that I'm, I was going to do the be post the best video ever. Oh my God. I, I really am going to still post it, but I just had another idea. Like, I'm not just going to post. I'm going to add some stuff to it and then make it like a real proper video. And then I'll, then I'll post it. So, I don't know. Now that I'm back home in Finland, I'll do it. So, maybe another two weeks or so and then I'll post that video. The video to end all videos. So, um, yeah, a lot of e-buggies out there, e-buggies.